I've recently been working on a software project called Sazura, and I thought I'd experiment with making a video series where I go through the code base and explain how the app is put together and the philosophy behind many of my decisions. It draws heavy inspiration from the glory days of iTunes, specifically iTunes 4, because that was really the peak of music player software for me. In recent years, as a lot of music consumption has moved towards streaming, music players intended for the playback of local files are few and far between, and either target people who dislike the iTunes style of library management or are noticeably worse than iTunes was 20 years ago. Because of this, I've not been satisfied with most music player software available in 2021, so I've taken the matter into my own hands. I recently released the first Mac version of Caesura, and the next few videos will focus on taking you through the steps of building that initial version. I'm also experimenting with adhering to the principles of something called trivial technologies. Trivial technology projects are meant to be trivial, malleable, and open. So what does that mean exactly? Trivial means that the project should be developed in a straightforward way that is easily understandable and accessible to new and old developers alike. Malleable means that the project should be structured in a way that makes it easily tweakable. This synergizes with the trivial nature of the project so that users feel empowered to add any features they want or need for themselves. And the reason users can add these features themselves is because the project is open. More specifically, it's licensed under a public domain equivalent license that allows anybody to do anything they want with the project source code. This video series plays into those goals. One of my quarantine pastimes has been to watch people like Joshua Stein and Andreas Kling guiding people through their personal software projects, and I think there's something really fascinating about hearing a sort of director's commentary for a code base going more in depth into why things were done a certain way. My goal with this series is to show how I'm approaching building my dream app in hopes of inspiring other people to build the things that they want to see in the world, and also show a realistic view of what that process is like. Yes, development has been my job for many years, but that doesn't mean I won't fumble or occasionally do things in suboptimal or inelegant ways as I try to get things to work. I want to briefly discuss what my high-level roadmap for this project is, as it will help you understand the flow of these videos. I intend for Caesura to be available for both the Mac and for iOS, but I want to do it in a very specific way. The first few episodes will focus on building the first functioning Mac version of Caesura, which implements about two-thirds of the functionality from the original version of iTunes. This is going to be done in isolation with no regard for the iOS version. The base features for this version are going to be basic library management, basic playlist management, and audio playback. Once that's done, I want to extract as much as possible from that initial Mac version into a separate framework that will be shared by the Mac and the iOS versions. I've never done this before, so I have no idea how difficult it's going to be or how to do it. Splitting that common underlying code into its own framework should make it easier to maintain feature parity and bug fixes across both versions of the app. Naturally, I'm also going to have to update the Mac version so it relies on the shared framework. Then I want to use that shared framework to build a version of the iOS app with feature parity with the Mac version. Since a lot of the feature set will already be implemented in the shared framework, a lot of this will boil down to user interface work and working around the limitations and differences of an iOS environment. Once all that groundwork is out of the way, I want to add features to both versions simultaneously and maintain feature parity. For the rest of this episode, I want to touch on some fundamental concepts that will come up in future episodes, and that may be foreign to you if you haven't developed on Apple platforms before. Caesura, at least for now, is entirely developed in Swift, which is a programming language I have limited experience with. If you're not familiar with Swift, it's not too different at a glance to most other commonly used languages with C-style syntax and named function parameters, so you shouldn't be too lost trying to understand source code. Most of my prior experience on Apple platforms took place when development was primarily being done in Objective-C, so I do have lots of familiarity with the environment and the APIs, but I don't necessarily express myself in a very swifty way when coding. In case you don't know me very well, I should also state my bias up front that I'm not a fan of Swift as a language, and I vastly prefer Objective-C. However, usually when Apple introduces a new technology, you'd be better to adopt it once it reaches a minimum level of maturity, because there's always the risk that the old technology will be abandoned and deprecated. Since this is a new project I'm intending to keep going as long as possible, it would be careless of me to try to stick with Objective-C despite my personal preference for it. The user interface for the Mac version of Caesura is implemented with Coco or AppKit. These names are interchangeable. Coco is a direct descendant of the Next Step UI frameworks from the 1980s. Apple inherited these frameworks in the late 90s when Steve Jobs returned to Apple with the acquisition of Next Computer, and they became the basis for macOS X's next generation UI framework. 
This is an incredibly mature framework for building desktop class applications, but it may sometimes feel dated compared to what's available now on iOS. You might think it's strange that Cezura isn't using Catalyst or Swift UI, which are two UI frameworks recently introduced by Apple, which allow for the sharing of code between the Mac and iOS, since that would definitely come in handy for a multi-platform app like this. Swift UI would be the obvious way forward. I strongly suspect that much like Swift is replacing Objective-C in most development today, Swift UI will likely do the same for both Coco and UIKit on the Mac and iOS respectively in a couple of years. Unfortunately, I made a couple scissor prototypes in Swift UI over the past year or so, and at the moment it's far too immature, especially on the Mac, to do the job right. Catalyst is a transitional technology meant to give an easy path for existing iOS developers to get their application on the Mac with minimal effort. We don't have an iOS app to port yet to the Mac, and certain controls that I want to use in the Mac version of Cezura have no full-featured iOS equivalents. I'm not particularly interested in re-implementing Cocoa tables on iOS, so that's a no-go for me. I don't know what I'm going to be using in the iOS version of Cezura yet, but it's definitely possible that SwiftUI may see some use there if it does the job reasonably well in certain contexts. Because I chose to use AppKit for my user interface, we get to use Interface Builder to visually lay out the interface in what's called a storyboard file. Storyboard files can encompass your whole app's user interface. The interfaces you build in your storyboards can interact with your code through outlets and actions. Outlets are a special kind of property that can be declared in your objects that will be automatically filled with a reference to an interface element that you created in Interface Builder. These are indicated by the at IB outlet keyword in the property declaration. For example, if I have a function in my app delegate that impacts whether a menu item is enabled or disabled dynamically, I might want to declare an outlet on my app delegate of type NS menu item and then bind it to that menu item so I can easily tweak its enabled status. Actions are methods on your objects that can be called in response to events triggered on interface elements built in Interface Builder. These are indicated by the at IB action keyword in the method declaration. For historical reasons, actions also need to be declared as exposed to the Objective-C runtime via the at objc keyword. In both cases, if the storyboard file is open in Xcode, a circle will appear to the left of outlet and action declaration lines in your code, and clicking on it will let you jump directly to the interface builder items that are associated with those declarations. Outlets and actions can link to other reference objects in the same scene, and to show you exactly what that means, I'm going to take you on a guided tour of the user interface file as it exists now. Interface Builder groups elements tied to different contexts into scenes. Some of these are interface elements, which can be visually edited within Interface Builder, and others are different application objects. Let's take a look at Cezura's scenes right now. I'm going to exclude those related to the Preferences window, as it's not going to be relevant for the next few episodes. The application scene holds the menu bar layout. Unlike Windows, where menu bars are within the scope of a window, menu bars on the Mac are global to the entire application, so that's why it's at the application level scene. It also holds a reference to the app delegate. Then we can move on to the main window controller scene. This holds the window and its toolbar. It has a reference to the window controller, which is an object that handles events related to the window itself. And it has two relationships. Well, I guess one of them isn't really a relationship. So this uh, main window controller scene is declared as being the entry point to the storyboard. And this says in the storyboard file, this is the initial window that needs to open when the app is launched. There's also a window content relationship to the main window view controller scene, which is the next scene we're going to be talking about. So let's jump right into that scene. Uh, now you might be saying, what's the difference between main window controller scene and main window view controller scene? Well, those two things are distinct. One of them is a window controller and one of them is a view controller. And the main window view controller scene specifically refers to the content of the window, which can be swapped out at any time. This is why it has a relationship of type window content with the main window controller scene. Now, this main window view controller uh, has a view, which is the interface element that is declared in Interface Builder. And this view in question is a split view. It's a split view that lets you uh, drag basically uh, the proportion between the source list, which is the left pane of the split view, and the collection view, which is the right pane of the split view that shows the tracks that are uh, part of the library or the playlist you selected on the left pane. And of course, it holds a reference to the main window view controller, which is a class in your code that uh, handles 
stuff uh, going on in this view. Uh, in our case, this split view can handle itself. It doesn't really have anything else that needs to be handled. So it's just a default implementation. And there are two relationships uh, with this scene. So both of them are split items relationships, which link out to the source list view controller scene and the collection view controller scene. So naturally, the source list view controller scene, it's the left pane of that uh, main window view controller. It holds the source list, which is what uh, lists your library and your playlists and maybe eventually uh, smart playlists and maybe even network devices. I don't know, the sky's the limit there. And of course it has that as the primary interface element and it has its own controller, the source list view controller, which there is a reference to in that scene. And of course the right pane has the same deal. Uh, so there's the collection view controller scene. It holds the collection uh, table view, which is the list of all of the tracks for the selected collections. And there is a reference to the collection view controller, which is again, a custom view controller that I wrote that handles uh, displaying the uh, collection of tracks that is selected. So what rules can we generalize from that quick tour of our scenes? Well, each scene revolves around a primary interface element. Uh, in our cases, it was either views, windows, or menu bars. That element has its own controller object. So the application scene has the app delegate, which is an application-wide controller, basically. Windows have window controllers and views have view controllers, and you can have multiple view controllers within a window. All of them have a default generic implementation out of the box. So you can just place these things in Interface Builder and they will behave as they do by default, and it's great. But if you want custom behavior, which you probably do if you're writing software, uh, you can write your own window controllers and view controllers and swap them in in Interface Builder. It's, you just change the name of the, the controller class and it just points to your new uh, implementation, which is great. You can customize behavior that way. And then within that controller, you can add outlets and actions, which allow you to basically interconnect what you see in Interface Builder with what you see in your code. And the last rule that we can generalize from this quick tour of the various scenes in Interface Builder is that relationships can exist between scenes and storyboards to form a sort of tree structure uh, that represents an entire window's contents. So here is a graphical representation of what that tree structure for the main window in Cicero looks like. Now, if all of this still seems like technical mumbo jumbo, it'll probably click once we actually put it into practice and start implementing some features. Cesura's music library is going to be stored in a SQLite database. SQLite is a database which is bundled with every single one of Apple's devices, and to be honest, probably most consumer electronics devices in your home. On Apple platforms, FMDB is my favorite way to talk to a SQLite database. It's a really great third-party library written by Gus Mueller of Flying Neat Software, and it gives you an Objective-C and Swift wrapper around SQLite that makes using it a lot simpler. We are going to be getting a lot of use out of FMDB in this project. The schema is the layout of database tables and columns within those tables. Database migrations refer to how developers manage incremental changes made to database schemas as new versions of software are released. For example, here are the database tables that Sozura needs to implement its first batch of features. The track table, which contains every track in the user's music library. This has a bunch of fields for metadata, as well as play count, skip count, last played date, date added, and a field for the file URL that we are going to use to load the music file. The ordered playlist table is an entry for a user-created playlist with a title and a sort mode property. The ordered playlist track table, which is what associates a track that belongs to one of the user's playlists. This table has a track ID, a playlist ID, and has a field to keep its order when the list isn't being sorted. This described schema is database schema version one. The code that takes our application from a blank database to schema version one is what we'd call migration one. If we had any other changes to make to the schema afterward, we could write a migration two that takes us from version one to version two. When the app launches, we need the app to check the database and see what version of the schema it has. If it doesn't have a version, then the database simply isn't initialized and it needs to run all the migrations in order to catch up to the latest schema version. If the schema version is one, for example, but the app's latest known schema version is version two, then we'll need to run migration two. This behavior is implemented in the migration helper class. 
It's initialized at the launch of the application with a database path, and we automatically handle looking up the schema version and running migrations if needed on launch before we initialize the rest of the data access layer. Caesura's interactions with the database will happen through the library service class. Library service is designed along the principle of command query separation. This is a principle that means the two following things. Anything that changes the contents of a database is implemented as a command, and anything that retrieves information stored in the database is implemented as a query. It's a design principle that aims to isolate things such that asking the database a question does not change the answer of questions. Using this approach can eliminate entire classes of bugs. It can also be helpful in simplifying how you reason about features that interact with a database by letting you boil it down to the individual reads and writes that you need to send to the database. You will get a much better sense for this once we actually get around to implementing features. The last piece of the puzzle I need to talk about in this Fundamentals episode is the Notification Center, which is one of many mechanisms on Apple platforms for intra-application communication. To be clear, this is not what users know as Notification Center, the OS-level drawer where your notifications pile up. This is a different Notification Center that is internal to your application where anything can fire off a notification and any other part of the app can register to those notifications and make something happen in response. It's like an application-wide intercom. Someone buzzes on the intercom and says what they have to say, and anyone who has anything to do in response to that intercom can do it isolated in their own part of the code. To be perfectly honest, I am still not entirely sure what I'm doing on the Mac when it comes to structuring my application's architecture, and especially when it comes to messaging important state changes from one component of the application to another. In the sake of just getting something working, I've thrown everything into Notification Center, and at least for now, it seems to be working fine. That said, I know a lot of developers look down on careless use of Notification Center and that you should ideally only use it in certain limited contexts, resorting to other design patterns for other contexts where it's less suited for. I just don't know all of the details surrounding that. I'm a new Mac developer, and instead of stalling and figuring it out before I continue with development, I'd just rather do something to get the ball rolling and be excited about developing this project and figure it out later. So as a result of that, you're going to be seeing a lot of notification center usage as glue between different parts of the application. And I want to be perfectly clear that while it does seem to be working fine, it's more of a temporary stopgap then it is correct use of this API. I'm sure we'll revisit this in a future episode where I make everything work the correct way. So those are all the fundamentals that I wanted to attack on this episode. So look out for the next episode, which is going to focus on implementing features regarding library management. And I'll see you then.